Is your home a Nickelodeon home? Nickelodeon is in the house. Homeboy, homegirl, check it out. You got Nickelodeon on the scene in the house on the TV screen. Hello everyone, this is Patricia, and we have ourselves another podcast discussing about the three original Nicktoons. Last week we had Casey and Ashley from the Friday Night Nicktoons podcast talking about how the Nicktoons influence entertainment. This week we have two very special guests discussing about how the three original Nicktoons influence pop culture. And what better way to have two very enthusiastic pop culture people. So uh, why don't the two introduce yourselves? Um, I'm Matthew Clickstein. I'm the author of Slimed, an oral history of Nickelodeon's Golden Age, a book that came out in 2013, uh, and uh, in which I interviewed about 250 different people involved in Nickelodeon uh, and uh, put together uh, kind of a unique oral history based on those interviews. Uh, I've uh, done a few uh, events with other Nickelodeon folks, uh, some involved in the book and some not. Uh, and I recently, uh, with my good friend and uh, brother in authorship, Kasim Gaines, uh, who will pop in momentarily here, uh, did a uh, an oral history of Nicktoons in particular from some material from those interviews that didn't make it into the book. Yes, and uh, I'm Kasim Gaines. I'm the author of three books on pop culture, uh, Inside Pee Wee's Playhouse, A Christmas Story Behind the Scenes of a Holiday Classic, and We Don't Need Roads, uh, the making of the Back to the Future trilogy, and I watched so much Nickelodeon as a kid. I'm pretty sure uh, you and Matt watched <laughs> watched a little bit more than I did, but I watched a lot. I was an only child for a long time, and so uh, just grew up watching so much Nickelodeon. But um, I was invited to work with Matt on these oral histories for Decider. And had such a great time um, going down memory lane. I, I'm a huge fan of Matt's book. I mean, I, I just Matt's a great friend, but um, his book captivated me, and I, I loved it. And it was great to be able to go through some of the deleted scenes of the book and um, help present it for people because it, it really deserved to be seen. All right, so um, right before we continue on with um, our main topic, um, I want to know about your earliest memory of Nickelodeon. Uh, For me, I actually have a very vivid memory of my first experience with Nickelodeon, and I think like a lot of kids our age, uh, it actually started with Nick at Night. Um, I just had this vision of... Dennis of Jay North is Dennis from Dennis the Menace running across the screen, tearing, terrorizing the uh, household with slingshot in back pocket and being completely fascinated by it, completely mesmerized. I asked my mom what it was and I had grown up 
already on Twilight Zone since I can remember. My mom and I, it was, it was a ritual for us to watch it every year or twice a year during New Year's and uh, Thanksgiving when everyone else was watching football. And so I was already uh, prepared for black and white television. Uh, so I really keyed in on it. And something about Jay North as Dennis and Dennis himself and the black and white completely compelled me. I had no idea what it was. She explained to me what this show was and some of her other favorite shows from that era that would also be on Nick at Night, like uh, Dobie Gillis and the like. And uh, I was hooked. And before I knew it, I realized there was a lot of other material on as well. I think I might have in passing seen a little bit of uh, the precursor to Nickelodeon Pinwheel. I certainly remember the theme song. But the first real vivid memory I have of actually sitting and watching Nickelodeon was with Dennis the Menace and Nick at Night. Yeah, it's funny. I, I guess um, Matt and I are almost the opposite because I think my first real memory was Nick Jr. and watching <laughs> a lot of <laughs> – that is, I, I'm a morning person. I'm, I'm going to say that Matt's a night person. <laughs> um <laughs> But I, I remember watching a lot of uh, Nick Jr. over at my, my grandmother's house. He used to babysit me, I guess, when I was um, too early, for, too young for school. And um, Eureka's Castle, I remember being a, something I really watched a lot. And David the Gnome, for some reason, but I don't really remember liking it all that much, but I watched it a lot. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, it's weird. It's, it's so weird. I, how, like, liked it, but I, I watched it all. <laughs> that, but I, I don't really remember ever really enjoying it. Um, but in terms of um, Nickelodeon, I know this isn't totally your question, but I, I remember being a big fan of the shows that were set in high school, and I really believed that um, – that that's what high school was like, you know, like, like it was depicted <laughs> like welcome freshman was like a real experience. I thought, um, and, and the fun fact, which I, I, I don't think I've ever told anyone, Matt, you'll probably find this really interesting, but I actually was, um, uh, I'll say on set quote unquote, it was, it was on location, but I was present during the filming of an episode of Pete and Pete. Actually, they, um, they filmed an episode in my town and, actually used um one of my absolute best friends at the house uh, at the time they like rented out his house not to film in but to use as like um for dressing rooms and for the crew and so i went down and it was a later season um i met i met everyone on set and met michelle trachtenberg and um she misspelled Every she wrote like me uh, wrote a little note for me and my little autograph book and she misspelled everything and I I still kind of remember she was a kid so I'm not picking on her but in my brain whenever I see Michelle Trachtenberg I always go did she ever figure out how to spell I hope so um, so yeah so I've got like a, a kind of that um, that that deep connection with with Pete and Pete too from that experience of actually being there while they filmed an episode and seeing the sausage get made I have to also agree with Cassine I, I one of the aspects of Nickelodeon and I talk a lot about this in the book and in previous interviews I think even with you a few times Patricia on some of your shows and whatnot uh, was that it, it seems so real and the the actors that they chose were real kids uh, 90% of them and so you connected with those people whether it was you can't do that on television or I agree wholeheartedly I very much assumed high school would be like welcome freshmen um I was so prepared for high school to be that way and in some ways it was in some ways it wasn't we know now that Bob Mittenthal the creator of the show really great guy still involved in Nickelodeon and also one of the creators of Double Dare um really did not like the show and was very disappointed in how it came together and he even says in the book some along the lines of it was a case study and how not to make a show. But um, I think our love of the show and, and just the uh, reverence that so many of us have for it, um, from the theme song that was rather like a kids in the hall uh, opening to just, you know, fun little moments with Freddie the freshman and everything, um, I think uh, defies uh, Bob's rather self-deprecating and humble, uh, uh, you know, remembrance of it. We clearly all really love that show. And even whenever I post anything about Welcome Freshman, it gets a lot of likes. And um, so, but I, yeah, to me, that was what high school was going to be. I, I assume people were going to be like Christine from You Can't Do That on Television when I got to be that age. It kind of uh, taught me what it was going to be like to be, you know, in my teens, uh, much more so than some of the shows that were on um, 
you know, again, Disney or, you know, I watched Beverly Hills 90210 like a lot of kids and such in that time. But, you know, that red is fake because they were older and they didn't look like us. Like they were all good looking. And, and they were you know. sexier. Yeah, they were yeah. they were more polished and, and um, the objective seemed different. You know, it seemed like it was more um, like teen fair for adults almost than teen fair for, for kids or teens. Well, yeah, and we, we, you know, we, I think both Cassine and I, uh, in our dealings with Doug, for example, um, saw and admired in it, uh, as, as it was so important to Jim Jenkins, the creator, that it was, it went beyond the typical kid show plots and, and, and cliches. Some of these storylines were rather unique and yet still very universal, uh, which was, I think, something that made Doug so uh, compelling to us. Even though it was an animated show, um, it felt very real, both because the characters were very real, the voice actors were doing a very good job. Um, obviously, the mouth sounds and the kind of minimalist quality of it made it easier to connect with. Um, there wasn't so much like you know nonsense going on on screen. It was just like real people. And it was plot lines that we can understand and that we connected with much more so than, say, Beverly Hills 90210 or Degrassi or whatever it might be that was a little bit more over the top and a little bit more kind of melodrama. Yeah, and I think that for the most part, you know, at the time when Doug first premiered, there weren't a lot of cartoons that had that kind of narrative, what many people call nowadays the slice of life genre, in which is about kids who go to school and live normal lives and at the time, I think that there was no other cartoon that was like that. I mean, I think the last time there was a cartoon similar to that was like the Charlie Brown and Snoopy show. And, you know, all the live action shows that, you know, were for the most part depicted high school for were for teenagers. So you didn't have a lot of, you know, sh- cartoons, let alone shows for kids that they can be able to relate to. I, I agree with that wholeheartedly, uh, Patricia. I think that's a very, very astute observation I think that the connection to Charlie Brown is ever present. Um, a lot of cartoonists, both comic strips and animation, will name drop Charles Schultz and the Peanuts uh, universe without really um, attempting to directly be inspired by it. Um, and yet, Doug and Jim Jenkins and the team at uh, Jumbo, the studio that that made it of Jim's, uh, definitely did just that. Uh, I think it's important to note, too, unfortunately, just because of organization's sake and structure and, frankly, word count, one thing that Cassine and I had to leave out of the oral history that we did for Decider um, uh, was that, and, and unfortunately, it was out of the book as well, and so it's still kind of a piece of information that's just lingering in the ether. Uh, Doug was the first animated series, like long form animated series in New York since I think like the sixties. Um, animation was not done in New York. It was done in LA at that time, aside from little bits and pieces, interstitials and commercials and the like. And in fact, uh, when they tried to do Doug in New York, it was a bit of a, kind of revolution and it sort of drove a lot of people crazy and you can't do that and how are you going to do that and that's not possible it's indeed one of the reasons Vanessa Coffey who basically shepherded uh, Nicktoons in those early days moved to New York from LA she wanted to actually get away from animation because she had become so disheartened and disillusioned by her work on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and the so-called toy driven cartoons that she kind of wanted to get away from so that's why she went to New York was because there wasn't long form animation there. And then suddenly, you know, as Nickelodeon started putting the block together and for whatever reason, they decided to do Doug there. Uh, Vanessa Coffey kind of got corralled back into it. So it, even on a production level, Doug was something that was both revolutionary and a resurgence of a simpler, easier time uh, just based on. It opened. It reopened long form animation in New York. Um, so I think that that's that's something kind of fun to remember about the show as well. There's two things that Matt said that I, I think really um, deserve some more attention, which is that you know, and, and this is in my Pee Wee book as well. You know, the the 1980s and, and early 1990s to an extent, um, so much of Kid Fair was about selling merchandise you know it was completely that that word <clears throat> toyetic 
was sort of coined uh, in a negative way after Batman and Robin came out. Um, but, you know, it was really about pound puppies and, and Smurf merchandise and even, you know, fraggles to an extent and just a lot of things that were really Transformers, um, really about just selling toys. And I think Nicktoons were always about telling stories, not about selling merchandise. And um, I, I think that's just an important sort of thing to remember. You know, as we look back, it's important to sort of put these shows in their historical context. Not that we have to, you know, get, get lofty about it, but, um, you know, it's those shows pierce through not just because Nickelodeon was ascending at the time, but also because the creators felt passionately about their work and they were doing it for a greater purpose than just trying to make a buck for, you know, a studio or, or a, a collaborator. Right. And I think that because of that, I think because it wasn't trying to focus on, oh, we're going to sell the latest toy or we're going to sell T-shirts or other forms of merchandise. I mean, it's like what you were saying in the chapter of Inside Pee-wee's Playhouse in which Paul Rubens wanted to create a show first and then focus on merchandise second. Um, because it wasn't so manipulative, because Doug, Rugrats, and Ren and Stimpy wanted to focus on creating stories and creating new characters that were completely different from, say, like, oh, you know, this to this cartoon was originally based on a toy or a celebrity or a movie. No, it was based off something original. It was based off of something that came from the creator's minds. And then we'll focus on the merchandise later. I think that, you know, adults... You know, just as uh, we didn't feel manipulated saying like, you know, this stuff is good for my kids. And not only that, but adults were able to get into the shows just as much as the kids like, um, you know, for, you know, for Rugrats, for example, you know, for kids, you know, the kid, the kids can watch Rugrats and see like, oh, the babies are having the imaginations and uh, all the characters are young and relatable. But the adults can see the perspectiveness of, you know, raising their own kids and a lot of the self parroting of how adults were at the time, like with Dee Dee uh, trying to be all health conscious or Stu trying to be like the auteur, like, you know, most people nowadays are becoming like doing their own freelance stuff, creating toys and, um, you know, focusing on, you know, what would Lip should say for how to raise a child instead of like using your own instincts and Charlotte Pickles constantly on the, her phone talking to her business uh, executives or whatever. And then for Doug's case about like going to school, um, living life, having to deal with certain issues. Or for Ren and Stimpy's case, like all this manic craziness that hadn't been seen since like the original Looney Tunes. And, you know, one of the first cartoons that brought not only kids and adults to watch it, but college students would watch it in a time in which Adult Swim didn't exist. So it kind of brought in a sense of togetherness for every single age demographic. And I think that's why the Nicktoons became such a worldwide phenomenon and then eventually would be in our pop culture, even still like 25 years later. I mean, a few days ago, Matthew, you posted on your Facebook page, like there's going to be a new store focusing on 90s Nickelodeon nostalgia in New York City. And I just still find that incredible. Yeah, to be clear, I, I, I quickly learned later, and, and it was a fun moment. Um, I saw my uncle, who lives in New Jersey, um, after we were doing some shooting on a documentary we're making about uh, Mark Summers. Um, and uh, my uncle, who lives in Jersey, had just been in New York City with my cousin, who was getting married, and they were seeing some locations for her wedding. And he and the family popped into a store, and lo and behold, they saw it was a nostalgia store, and that there, right up front was a whole section of slime uh, and, and uh, various items and apparel uh, that were associated with slime. And, of course, there's my book also, uh, which was kind of fun to see the picture. And I posted it just thinking, oh, isn't this neat? Well, it turns out it's actually part of um, a pop-up uh, store theme that Nickelodeon's partnered with with a store called Story. It's going to be happening until September 18th, and it's also happening in Santa Monica in L.A. there. Um, so that was just kind of a fun thing. Um, plugs aside, uh, I think that you really hit on two very important points about the resonance uh, of Nicktoons, one being certainly that it's transgenerational, um, that it was for and made for. It was intentional. It was for kids and parents and college stoner kids. 
And I think you could say it about all three of the Nicktoons, even though Ren and Stimpy is the most obvious one. Rugrats definitely had a sensibility to it that was for older people and for, you know, stoner college kids, if you will. I mean, uh, sure. Way- I mean, have you seen some of the stuff in the original run recently? Like, there's some yeah. trippy moments, like in the episode in which Tommy has to no longer drink from the baby bottle. And he has that tripped up dream where there's like bottles floating all over the place. So- and just even the, the angles and everything that they did, we talk a lot about it again in Slime the Book, but, you know, Peter Chung was only involved in the earliest days just because he bounced off to go do surprise surprise neon clucks which had a similar kind of otherworldly wide angle um strange animation style to it um but uh, he really made it so that you felt like you were on an alien planet which is is what gabor shupo and uh paul germain who were who were very involved in how the show came together um, and we're two of the creators of the show, along with Arlene Klasky, wanted it to look and seem like. And of course, and you know, I know Cassine would agree with this. You can't do better than bringing on Devo's Mark Mothersbaugh to do the music for something like that. Um, and you know, it all came together to create something that was truly transgenerational, um, which I think is very important. And of course, the creator-driven aspect of it—the fact that they were going to the creators of these shows, to these frustrated artists who had been pining away and laboring away and toiling away doing work they did not like and were not proud of you know basically sweatshop style almost for some of these animated series that Cassine was talking about earlier that were really about selling product and not about creating something that was quality animation or storylines um you know suddenly these these men and women were able to break loose and create something that was about themselves and about their friends and about something they really wanted to see out there And that's why these three cartoons were so damn good. And they were given such freedom, if not money, um, but that's a whole other thing, to do that and to realize their dreams and why we have these incredible three shows, especially in their earliest seasons like Rugrats. Right, exactly. And um, it's funny because, you know, in our day and age when, um, you know, these three shows are considered to be classics for many people and... You know, eventually there comes a time in which, you know, you see the merchandise that are coming in. And, you know, it's funny because um, I was in, let's see, I was in the, I was visiting New York last week and I went over to the National Museum of the American Indian and there was a section of these, you know, drawings that kids drew that had like Native American themes. And I saw one of a little girl, I believe, who drew Spongebob Patrick and Squidward as like Native Americans or something like that. And it's in a museum, an actual museum. And then there was one instance in which you have all those art galleries, like the one that happened for the 25th anniversary in um, in California, where they had this art gallery of, you know, not only the Nicktoons, but also like the live action shows. And then there's... Um, you know, um, you know, Mitchell Kriegman just, you know, released things I can't explain. The continuation of Clarissa explains it all. And she talks and he talks about like how Clarissa is a struggling journalist who's been, you know, overtaken by, you know, pop culture websites like Buzz, um, what was it? Buzzfeed and Pop Sugar. Yeah. And then, of course, you know, you have people online on YouTube talking about like how, you know, the Nicktoons, uh, you know, how they were a big part of their childhood and, You know, and so on and so forth. And, you know, of course, there's the T-shirts that, you know, of Double Dare T-shirts and, you know, all that stuff. It's like, you know, it's it's because of, you know, those creators wanting to break out of not doing cartoons based off of toys and action figures that, you know, that, you know, same amount of creativity was able to capture the imaginations of so many people that, even still to this day, people still have a connection towards it. And, you know, when there's like a talk about, oh, you know, that this is going to be coming back in a, as a revival or a reboot, people are getting angry about it because it's like, you know, that meant a lot to me. It was something that was a part of me that I used to watch with my friends when I was a kid. And, you know, it just shows you that how strong, you know, the the shows that came out of Nickelodeon during the time still resonates with people. Well, I, I, you know, I think um, there's an expression that sort of comes to mind that, the more the more personal something is the more universal it is you know and and i think that you saw that with nicktoons in these creator driven uh animation shows you know it, it's not 
dissimilar, not to not to keep pivoting to Pee Wee, but it's not dissimilar um, from Pee Wee's Playhouse, where obviously that was a show that was primarily, you know, Paul Rubens. He was the, the driving creative force. Um, but, you know, it, it's funny because it's reminding me of Matt's um, slimed event in New York a couple of years ago. And you know, I watched so much Doug growing up. And, and I know I'm, I'm not alone in feeling this way, but I... I was Doug, you know, I felt like I was Doug, you know, and I, and I knew all of those, uh, all of those characters were, were a part of my world and my network of friends. And to see Jim Jenkins, I, I don't think I actually met him, um, but I, I did obviously I saw him at the event and um, it, the, the feeling that I got just from seeing him and even when I still see him, whether I, I think, um, Patricia, you had him on a podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. I, I listened to that. I listened to him on your podcast and I, you know, whenever I see him pop up on the internet, I know that Matt posts about him quite a bit. And you know, the, the feeling I get from seeing him still is so strong to me. And, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough, um, you know, in terms of writing where I speak to a lot of people and I don't really get too starstruck or anything like that but um that show was so personal and i think even as a kid watching it you you sensed and knew that that show was personal um to this guy named jim jenkins who you didn't know who he was but his name was was all over the credits (laughs) um that to see him now as an adult um you know, I just want to I just want to hug the guy and shake his hand and just tell him um, how much he has impacted my life and how much his show spoke to me. And I think that's the amazing thing about uh, Nick Tunes, whether they're sort of more sweet and poignant or um, whacked out and crazy like Ren and Stimpy. You know, they are they are personal and they they come from someone's heart and head and um as a result they they sort of hit the audience on that level too which is which is dissimilar from a lot of other more disposable uh, children's television that is currently on tv um perhaps even currently on nickelodeon if we can say that um and certainly was out you know 25 years ago competing with these nicktoons Yeah, definitely. And I think that, um, I mean, even I just recently listened to the Nickelodeon Animation podcast and Jim was mentioning that, um, you know, I went over to a elementary school not too long ago and I asked them, does anybody know what Doug is? And he said that at least uh, a few students raised their hand and he was like, I'm shocked about this because this show came out like way before they were born and they know what Doug is and they've seen the show. And, you know, I mean, with that show, you know, still resonating with so many people, they were able to introduce it to their younger siblings and eventually to their children. And it's still universal. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. I, and, and uh, Cassine hit the nail right on the head. Um, and again, um, this is discussed, I can't even remember now, it's so blurred, either in the book or in our uh, shared oral histories uh, on, Decide, on Decider. Um, but uh, Vanessa Coffey, when she was putting together the block, uh, really felt that it was basically uh, a menu, if you will, whereas, and even in the way that it was scheduled, so that, um, you know, Doug was your. Uh, appetizer, your vegetables, um, and Rugrats was the, kind of the meal, and then Ren and Stimpy was the dessert. Um, and I, you know, I think that that is such a beautiful uh, and evocative way of describing how the block came together. And you know, lest we forget that that's really important. That there was organization, even in how they put the block together. They weren't just arbitrarily choosing shows, as I'm sure you know, Patricia, um, certainly Cassine does at this point, um, as I'm, I'm sure a lot of your listeners. There were originally eight different pilots that were being developed, a couple by people that Nickelodeon was already working with, like Cosgrove Hall, who did shows like Duck, uh, like Count Duckula and Danger Mouse, um, and you know, show that Joey Album, who did a lot of the dinosaur interstitials, did. Um, and various other people that they were already working with. And they chose uh, three shows very intentionally. They really knew what they were doing. And not only were these shows chosen because of that kind of vegetables, entree, 
dessert quality that they had uh, with each other, but also because each one was so incredibly different than the other and yet had that theme of being intimate, very real, very creative, creator driven. So they were able to figure out a way to make sure it had that thumbprint they were looking for that connected them all while also all being so disparate that you really got um, a lot of different flavors. You can watch each one of them and say, this is distinctly Doug, this is distinctly Rugrats, this is distinctly Ren and Stimpy after watching one frame of the cartoon. And yet you could also say, this is distinctly Nickelodeon. And that is an incredible feat and really shows the brilliance uh, and how uh, well thought out all this was by, pe by people like Vanessa Coffey and uh, others who were involved, obviously the president of the network, Jay Laybourne, um, and various others who were involved in the block itself, Fred Seibert and Alan Goodman, who helped to come up with other aspects of it, along with some of the branding that they'd been doing at Nickelodeon. So this, this is a really smart, really creative group of young artists who are figuring it out on every level on an individual level and as on a general level, on a branding level and on an artistic level. And I just, I agree with Cassin. I don't think that's the kind of thing that we see as much anymore um, in a lot of pop culture there, be it TV, film, certainly animation, what, what have you. Um, and I think that's a shame. Certainly there's exceptions. Um, I love BoJack Horseman, for example. It's one of the few new shows that I actually do pay attention to. And I think that has a very similar kind of very intentional quality. Um, when you read interviews with the creator and other people involved in that show, you can see they really understand what they're doing on every level. Um, but, you know, I just don't think we, we've seen and are going to continue to see that kind of passion that we had with Nicktoons. And I think that's one of the reasons, again, we're talking about these particular three shows uh, 25 years later. Now, we're not saying that, you know, the, the shows that are out nowadays is bad. No, of course not. We're just saying that, you know, in a time in which it was considered to be the dark age of animation, in a time in which there was little to no creativity around, you have these three shows that came out of pretty much nowhere in a company that did have a little bit of recognition with, like, Double Dare and You Can't Do That on Television, but it was these three shows that paved the way for a whole network to basically be like the definitive show, uh, you know, program for for kids for like, you know, you know, for like decades. And, you know, it was just something that was completely different. I mean, you were right when you were saying earlier about like each and every single one of these Nicktoons were distinct from one another. No, none of the three were the same in any way. It's not like you can watch like these three shows and like, oh, um, they, they have the same animation. Oh, they have the same music. Oh, they have the same premise. It's like, no. You know, Doug was about a preteen going through school. Rugrats was about babies. Ren and Stimpy was about a dog and a, and a cat going through crazy, manic, insane adventures. So each and every single one of them were distinct in their own way. And every single one of them had a different style of animation. You know, Doug had that sketchy pencil look. Rugrats had that Eastern European flair. Ren and Stimpy were going back into the days of, like, you know, Bob Clampett and Looney Tunes and Hanna-Barbera with their, you know, detailed animation. So it was all different. And, you know, each kid can choose one Nicktoon that they liked and they can be able to stick with it. Or maybe they can watch all three of them and, you know, see, you know, back to back to back. And, you know, it's something that people talk about in like the school uh, bus or around lunchtime. It was something that you ran home to after school so you can be able to tune in or watch it at night. So, I mean, even, even still to this day, you know, going back to like pop culture, I mean, you know, there's art galleries for it. There's T-shirts selling on like, you know, various nostalgic stores. There's, um, you know, conventions in which people go over to um, panels and they discuss about the legacy of these shows. Uh, there's so much of it. And, you know, it, it's like one of the many ways in which our pop culture was able to expand on it and able to bring these shows still to life in a time in which, you know, these shows were around. Now they're not here anymore. Let's move on to the next thing. So, yeah, I mean, that's how, you know, the Nicktoons was able to still resonate with us. Well, I, I think there's, I mean, you know, I I don't think it's, for me, I don't think it's a question about um, good or bad in terms of 
current shows, but I think there is a major philosophical difference, which we've all sort of been dancing around. Shows today, I think, um, reek of of being uh, focus grouped, you know, in, in terms of, you know, I think they all play to a very safe, generic um, slice of America. And it's very hard, at least for me, as someone who doesn't really watch a lot of children's television now, um, to distinguish between a show like um, So Victorious or, well, I actually, I, I thought Drake and Josh was actually a pretty um, funny show, but, you know, So Victorious, Drake and Josh, iCarly, I mean, they all, you know, if you watch them on mute or if you watched, you know, five minutes of any of those shows, it would be hard to tell which is which. I mean, they're all kind of, the same thing, <coughs> just, Dan Schneider. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, well, yeah, but I, but I think they, I think they all play. Um, they're all very safe, you know, shows, and they don't really um, take very many risks. And I think the thing that keeps coming up in my mind as we're talking is, it's easy to understand how someone could go into a pitch meeting and describe the plot of. Doug or Ren and Stimpy or Rugrats and have someone like chase them out of an executive's office in 2016 and say, you know, there's no way we can ever sell a show with a pencil, a pencil sketch kid who has uh, you know a bunch of other friends and he's pining for this girl and he lives in, in this tiny town of Bluffington. And, you know, it just, it, it doesn't sound compelling or interesting or, or sexy or whatever the case may be. And yet, it was a fantastic show. Um, so I just think one of the, the unfortunate things that's happened of late is that studios and, and networks have become um, less willing to take a chance on a creative and um, they've become less willing to believe that if you get good people to produce good product, an audience will come. Instead, it's a lot of um, I think art by science, you know, as I kind of call it, which I think is not, I don't know how many people 25 years from now are going to say, I got into the television business because of iCarly. You know, <laughs> I just don't know how, how many people are going to say that. I don't think very many. You know, and, and Patricia makes a, I, uh, incidentally, I of course agree with, with what Cassine is saying totally. And I, I think really when we admit it to ourselves, I, I think a lot of people, especially in our age group, would say that because we were around for a lot of revolutions happening uh, in pop culture at the time just because of the uh, the prevalence of the way that technology was changing and because of a lot that was happening in animation. Um, you know, we, we can't forget that when everything was happening with Nicktoons at this time, um, because of, frankly, technology, legal reasons involving uh, choices that were being made by the FCC as far as not allowing uh, networks to just have what they call 30-minute long um, toy commercials anymore, allowing networks to own their their own property so they didn't have to just license material from, say, Warner Brothers for Looney Tunes. There was a lot happening at that time. And suddenly, at the same time that you had Nicktoons developing, you had, uh, you know, uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, which was an incredible film. You had movies like The Little Mermaid, which were incredibly well done, even by established uh, studios like Disney. Um, And you had things a little bit later down the road, like what was going on with Spike and Mike's animated Twisted Film Festival. So you had things like Beavis and Butthead coming together. You had Liquid Television, which also aired, again, Peter Chung from Rugrats' Aeon Flux. So we were around for something very, very um, uh, uh, compelling going on in the animation world. We were young enough to remember when it was still Transformers and early Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and yet we were also there for when it changed completely to this creator-driven, much more realistic, much more intimate, much more uh, creative and innovative kind of animation that was happening that would open the doors for things like SpongeBob and Adult Swim and shows like, again, uh, BoJack Horseman. Um, and so, um, I think that that's a lot of what made that era so special and why people like Cassine and I, um, might lament the way that choices are being made now for the most part. Yes, we do have things like BoJack and I agree with you, Patricia, I'm not saying necessarily there's not anything good on now. Of course not. 
But I, I agree with Kasim. Those risks just aren't being made as much as they used to, it seems. And from people like Kasim and I, who are very engaged in that world, who are interviewing people all the time, we're both very active journalists, even outside of our books and whatnot. So, yeah, I hate to say it, we, we kind of do know. This is our field, and I can say that the people I talk to, those kinds of risks just aren't being made anymore. And, and frankly, you know, I'll wrap this part up by saying I think we can see it very clearly in that so many of the programming that we see, whether it's live action or animation, it keeps being made by the same people, you know. Um, and whether you like their material or not, whether they're successful or not, you know, that's great and everything. And I certainly understand on a logistics and paperwork level – why those choices are being made, but I would like to see more disparate, um, uh, you know, uh, producers. For the most part, I mean, all the stuff that you're talking about when it comes to like, we want to present our own stuff that, you know, we're going to see if we can be able to break the mold with what's going on right now. I mean, it's like, you know, back then, you know, people didn't treat animation seriously. They thought, oh, it's just some, you know, cartoon for kids and we're just going to post whatever because they'll eat it up. But then when, you know, the Nicktoons became such a massive hit and, you know, at, at times in which, you know, I feel that, you know, we take creativity for granted. I feel that, you know, because the Nicktoons were able to become such a big hit on people who didn't do anything outside of maybe just a few small things or, you know, people who were basically just graduating from art school and they want to see if they can take their big shot at the, uh, you know, at the animation industry. And at the time, you know, they were like, oh, yeah, 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 sure. Just, you know, go ahead and do that. And it's like they decided, you know what, I'm going to take a shot at this. And you know what they did? They took a shot and it became big because of that. And I guess, you know, as time went on, you know, as time, as censorship became much more prevalent or, you know, something like Doug, I mean, to be quite honest, it's pretty sad, but, you know, something like Doug cannot be done anymore unless you're able to make it more, um, you know, like more crazy because, you know, they'll say that, oh, you know, something like Doug, it'll bore kids to death. You know, it's too simple. It's too basic. You know, we need something, you know, more crazy or we need something more action packed to get the kids sitting down. For the most part, it's like we're back to square one again in which we have these people who are saying like, OK, you need to do a show for this and for this and this demographic and you have to have this and this way to do it. And, you know, there's a new generation of animators who are like saying, you know what? I want to do it my way. And so they're not going over to the TV executives and they're not going over to the industry. They're doing it online. They're creating unique shows online for people to watch. They're creating, you know, shows like Homestar Runner or Ruby or Tome or Ed's World, you know, even for Netflix and Hulu and Amazon, you know, like you were saying before, there's BoJack Horseman, there's F is for Family and for live action shows, there's Orange is the New Black, there's Stranger Things. So, you know, maybe for TV, maybe we're not going to be able to see like the next generation of the Nicktoons for now, but there's more media that we didn't have 25 years ago. 25 years ago, we didn't have the internet. We didn't have social media like Facebook and Twitter. We didn't, ha I mean, you know, us talking right now on Skype. I mean, that's something like we saw on the Jetsons. It's like, oh, that's never going to happen. <laughs> but the point is, is that um, I think that there is a little bit of creativity out there that, you know, it's, it's just somewhere else. And, you know, because of the Nicktoons being one of the main reasons on why we can have creator driven cartoons, there's people out there that are saying like, I want to do this show my way and there's going to be a way to do it. And we can just post stuff out there and people will see it. Um, I, I agree with you, Patricia, on some of that. And uh, certainly I'm not saying there's not creativity out there. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm working in the field. I, I think I'm pretty creative. I know Cassine certainly is a, a lot of what you do. Patricia is great. And there, there are some great shows out there. There's some great books, music, um, films and the like. So I'm not saying that there's any real issue with or, or a, a, a dearth of um, or a drought rather of, uh, of creativity right now. Uh, I am saying, though, that I just agree again that some of those risks are not being made in a mainstream level. And although we might say at this point, maybe things like Netflix and Amazon and even uh, certain channels on YouTube and the like could be considered mainstream i mean for goodness sakes i think it was uh honest trailers just got nominated for a good for an emmy for goodness sakes 
Um, but uh, so that is happening. At the same time, though, uh, you'll find that anyone that you know who's actually producing material for whether it's the Internet or, uh, you know, even things like Netflix and Amazon still at this point, there's just not a lot of money and credibility to it, but particularly money at this point. And it makes it very difficult. Again, I think goes back to finding people who we normally wouldn't think about to create uh, this property. It will end up being people who are already in the industry, people who have enough money independently wealthy where they can do that. Um, my very good friend, Lily Emerson, for example, she, she creates a really fun product called Adventure Sandwich. And it is beautiful. It is so much fun. It's like early Pee Wee's Playhouse. Everything's done with cardboard and whatnot. She has a, a group of art, artist friends in Chicago who put it together. I highly recommend everybody check it out. It's called Adventure Sandwich. But you know what? It's extremely expensive to do. And it's extremely difficult to do. And she and her husband, you know, they're our age. They live in a closet. They both of them are working, you know, day jobs when they can. They don't have a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of money for things like props and whatnot. And it's very, very hard. And I'm not going to say his name, but they were going to partner up with someone who was at one point involved in Nickelodeon and has done some pretty big things. And he basically told them, you know what, give me 52 episodes. I will post them online and we'll hope for the best, which is a business plan that he's actually uh, utilized in the past. And you know, she, Lily came back and he said, well, how does he expect me to make 52 episodes? I don't have time or money for that. So I think that that is a little problematic, though, that there's certainly anyone could put up anything. You can do this podcast and people can put up their own YouTube films and animation, whatever it is. I know plenty of people who do it. I every now and then will post some fun stuff. But as I think Cassine would agree with me, because we talk about this sometimes, there's just there's not a lot of money there, and it makes it very difficult to for someone who is just a regular person who's just working a day job or two or three and trying to be an artist to get their material out there on the same level as someone who maybe you know is an actor who has some money and time or is the son or daughter of someone famous or whatever it might be. And I, I think that that is still going to be a problem and ultimately lead to those fewer risks being taken. You know, as far as opening doors to people who. You know, we normally wouldn't hear from or see or see their material because, you, you, you know, to keep up with online stuff, you need money. And it's and it's rough and it's tough and it's difficult. And there was a time in the 80s when, you know, hardcore music happened and the Riot Girl movement happened and the zine movement happened. And even without the Internet and the like, there were some cr pretty incredible movements, hip hop for goodness sake, in the 70s, came from nowhere. There was no money. There was no resources. It was a group of people who made it happen, and they did it without social media, without the Internet. I'm not saying the Internet's not good. I'm not saying it's not helpful. Of course it is. But, you know, I'm just saying that we need to kind of consider all of these factors when we're discussing uh, topics like, you know, is it is it uh, more helpful now? Is it more risk taking now? Are there more risky things happening online or versus TV? And you know, it's a complicated issue, and I think it's a lot of fun to discuss. And uh, you know, that's just kind of how I feel about it. I just I'm not saying any either one's worse or better. I'm just saying that it's different, and that there's a lot of complicated components to this discussion that need to be considered when we're talking about you know online material versus you know the more mainstream fair. Yeah, I think the, the, just the one thing I wanted to add, and I, you know, it's funny because that uh, took a lot of the, <laughs> the words out of my mouth in terms of, you know, having, you know, <laughs> creators that. having. <clears throat> I mean, Matt, Matt and I talk about this, you know, all the time, you know, off record, you know, off off, off the off the, uh, off the airwaves here. But um, but the other thing is that you have to remember whether it was Pee Wee or it was Nicktoons or a lot of the shows that you mentioned, uh, Patricia. Currently, you know, when when you aren't on top, you have to take risks. You know, networks are more willing to say, let's try a Stranger Things. You know, as mainstream as Netflix has become, Netflix isn't in every home. It isn't, you know, it, it isn't, um, you know, uh, cable television. It isn't network television. And so they can they can do more, you know, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt is a show that NBC passed on and then they took it to Netflix. I mean, there are other shows certainly that are like that as well. There, you know, we all know there are shows that have gone to die 
on on network television or cable television, and then have been resurrected through streaming. Um, and so, when you look at Nickelodeon twenty five years ago, um, certainly it, it wasn't the Nickelodeon that it is today. And I think the the unfortunate thing, and this happens in every field, not just in television, not just Nickelodeon. This isn't a knock on anyone. It's just a, a sad commentary on capitalism, frankly, is that people often lose sight of what made them successful. And they turn into these factories almost, you know, these art factories. I mean, look at James Patterson. You know, James Patterson, I don't think, writes a single James Patterson book. You know, they're, they're literally just these, um, these almost corporate entities, even if they're people as individuals, that just churn out art for us to consume because you don't have to take risks when you're winning is, is the unfortunate attitude. You know, we'll, we'll come back on this podcast in five years and see how many risks Netflix is taking or whether or not they're all doing, you know, pretty standard fare. And I think that's, um, that's important. You know, it's, it's, um, Matt's point, uh, a couple of minutes ago about, the moment in time in terms of the FCC and, you know, parents groups, you know, uh, Peggy Charon and and her, uh, I don't remember, Matt, do you remember the name of her group? The, um, yeah, it was, it was, it was, I think something like act or something like that, like association um, of concern something or, yeah, yeah, I know, I know what you mean though. Yeah. Yeah. I I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, she had, you know, that, that group of, of, um, concerned parents that were, um, you know, regulating, not regulating, but um, lobbying, really. You yeah, know? they were like the MPAA for children. <laughs> right, yeah. It, it, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways, um, there were people who resented that and um, were brave enough to sort of say, we're going to push the bounds. You know, if you're, if you're into film at all, you know that this happened, you know, back in the, the 30s with like the Hayes Act. You know, there were filmmakers that said, okay, these are the rules, and now let's push the bounds of that. Um, and I think you saw a lot of that in the, the mid to late 80s and, and certainly early 90s, um, which is a part of the reason why those shows were made, I think. You know, Ren and Stimpy is um, completely, like, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that a show like Ren and Stimpy was on children's television. <laughs> Um, you know, it would amaze me even if it were today, but I think, um, you know, creatives and networks weren't going to be bossed around by parents' rights groups. And, um, and that's, that's where that came from, at least in, in part. You know, I, and, and I'm sorry, Patricia, I just have to tag on there because Cassine was making some really good points. One, one thing though, that he might not be aware of, and excuse me, Cassine, if, uh, if I'm mistaken here. But um, you would think that Peggy uh, Charon and her uh, parents' right uh, parents uh, uh, group uh, would not have liked a lot of what was going on at Nickelodeon, and indeed in the beginning they didn't. But then they, Jerry Laybourne actually told me that they actually ended up switching gears, and for a very interesting reason, they actually started awarding early Nickelodeon, and I don't think it was around the time of Nicktoons. It was it was still a little earlier, but we're still talking like you know. Uh, you can't do that on television and whatnot. They w- awarded Nickelodeon some certificates and whatnot, and actually started recommending Nickelodeon. Why? Because it was quality television for kids. Mm-hmm. Yes, they didn't particularly like some of the scatological tendencies and some of the violence and so forth, and and yada yada, like on You Can't. But they really appreciated, and I'm pretty sure I remember a story Jerry Laybourne, the president of the network at the time, told me he recounted of Peggy basically coming up to her and saying thank you. And and just they appreciated that, well, you know, it, content-wise, it might not be exactly what we would wish for, but, boy, these are people who really care about the kind of programming they're doing. This is not just about commercials. This is not just about toy-driven dreck. And thank you for doing that Nickelodeon. And I think that that's something that's really important, that it actually transcended... Uh, a, a, a parent groups like that conservative, let's say, uh, politics to say, you know, we might not agree with what you're doing, but thank you for making it quality at least. Thank you for making it something, that, you know, is good for kids to watch because it's actually good. 
you know? And I think that that's at a really important point there, too. It's funny. I, I didn't know that, but it, yeah. it doesn't surprise uh, me. No. Um, it, it was actually the same with Pee Wee, too. You know, Pee Wee was, was subversive and uh, had a lot of innuendo, and Peggy Charon actually uh, grew to like that show as well. <laughs> so, so I think it does say something about, you know, quality over... Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I think I think um, I, I get it. I see it, and I think that's a good uh, a good thing to sort of um, to clarify. I think we can start wrapping things up. I mean, I know we can talk about this stuff for hours, but let's just end yeah. this on a more happier note. So. I mean, in your opinion, I mean, what's the most recent thing that you saw, whether it be like, um, you know, maybe like a piece of art, like fan art or maybe um, uh, listening to a podcast or, you know, something like that? What was the last time that you I mean, the more the most recent thing that you guys saw in which you knew for sure that, OK, the Nicktoons have left a massive impact on pop culture and it's not going to go away anytime soon. Oh, boy. Um, you know, I. I, you know what, I, I think what it is, is, um, you know, Matt Slimed Page uh, still posts, I'm saying Matt's page posts it as if Matt isn't posting it. Uh, Matt, <laughs> Matt, Matt still posts, you know, a, a lot of, um, whenever Nickelodeon is doing something, whether it's the Hey Arnold film, or um, I just saw they're doing something with Rocco's Modern Life. Is it a TV movie? Is that what they're doing? Yeah, yes. An hour on TV movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I, I, you know, I think the reaction, you know, and I have a, um, a Facebook page which posts, you know, all about pop culture. It's not just Nickelodeon stuff. And I, I, there's a noticeable uptick whenever it is something that's Nick-related. And I think that um, the moments that make me say that Nickelodeon isn't going away are things like, when I was in New York for Matt's slimed event, um, when I post something on Facebook or Matt posts something on Facebook, um, and it, it lights up social media, um, when you know your your podcast, you know your podcast is is not solely focused on Nickelodeon, but you do a lot of Nickelodeon and um, and it resonates with people, and I think that that's you know I watched your. Um, I watched your your uh, birthday video, and there were a lot of people that said that they uh, were brought to your podcast because you were discussing something that was Nickelodeon related um, over the course of, of the last several years. And so, to me, those are the moments that make me say, "Wow, what these people did twenty five years ago um, isn't going to die because." it still resonates with us on, on sort of a, a guttural level. Um, I, I think that's, that's it. It isn't really, you know, per se fan art or anything like that. It's just the core emotional reaction um, that people have. You know, Matt mentioned, I don't remember if it was on air or if it was before we got on air, but um, for the, the Mark Summers documentary that he's filming, we were uh, at Robin's house and you know, Robin, we, we got into a conversation about obviously Nickelodeon um, when she wasn't filming. And it's just so clear that that period of time resonates with her as someone who was creating. It resonates with us as people who are watching and are now creating as a result of that. Um, and so it, it's just cyclical and, um, Actually, cyclical isn't really the word. It's it's um, exponential, really. It's 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 moving forward. It isn't really repeating. And I think that that's the fantastic thing that um, makes me say that Nickelodeon, classic Nickelodeon, good Nickelodeon, isn't ever going to die. I, I'm uh, and and I appreciate everything Cassine said, and I uh, I agree with that, and I I'm honored and uh, appreciative too that he that much of what has instilled in him the concept that Nickelodeon, classic Nickelodeon lives on is uh, related to some of the material that I've uh, put out there. Um, you know, we work very hard on it and Cassine has become not only a, a good friend, but also someone who's been very helpful in everything from consultation to the work that we did together on the decider oral history. And simply because we are wrapping up here, I just want to make it clear in case anyone doesn't know that um, our oral history uh, it's actually a four-part series uh, about the Nicktoons block, uh, Rugrats, Ren and Stimpy, and Doug. That is up there now. Um, People Magazine actually 
Uh, I'm going to say aggregated some of the material from that as the euphemism they like to use, but they basically rewrote a lot of the material we did, which is fine. You know, they're getting it out there and they link to our stuff, but it's out there if anyone wants to check it out and see some more of what we're talking about here. Um, and I, I'm really grateful that Decider did that and that Cassine uh, worked with me on that project. Um, I will uh, say here that I'm going to go back to BoJack Horseman again. I really am. Um, as a lot of my friends know, uh, I think Cassine included, I'm not really someone who watches a lot of TV anymore for a number of reasons. Some of it's just time and I don't want to kind of get wrapped up in, you know, Game of Thrones and these shows where you, it becomes a part of your life. And, you know, I get it and I appreciate it and everyone's got their thing, but I just, I'm, I'm choosing to kind of stay away from that right now for various reasons. Um, but I, for some reason, I started watching BoJack Horseman when I was at a friend's house when it first started I personally don't have Netflix. I don't even have a TV in my uh, new house right now. Um, but I, every time a new season's on every year, I, I make sure to watch it. And I'm so spellbound by it. And I am reminded of early Nicktoons. I am reminded of Rugrats and Doug and Ren and Stimpy. And I think that BoJack Horseman um, uh, evokes and invokes much of what we're talking about here. I think it's risk-taking. I think it's very distinctive animation. I love the music. I love the incidental music as well as the theme music. Um, I think it's very funny. It's transgenerational. Um, I think that the references are a lot of fun, but you could still enjoy it even if you don't catch a lot of the references, as I don't always do, since I don't keep up on a lot of, again, new TV shows and the like they sometimes reference. Um, and I know that this was something that a lot of people have talked about already, so nothing new, but the episode where they go to the underwater film festival, I thought was beautiful. I thought it was very funny, very charming, uh, heartwarming, very, very creative. And to know that the creator, um, I'm going to mess up his name, of course, uh, uh, Raphael Bob Wakesburg, I think it is, um, had been wanting to do that since season one. And here we are season three, and he finally got to do it. I think, again, it shows my point that he knows what he's doing from day one. Um, the way that they wrapped up season two, the way that they wrapped up season three, clearly they know what's going on throughout the, the, the line here. And I think that that's great. And I'm so proud and happy to see that programming like that, especially in the animation world, is still on, still going. And, you know, just an easy one. Um, the one other show I really keep up with is South Park. And I think the last two seasons of South Park have absolutely killed it. I think that they are uh, very I resonant agree. in a lot of ways. Sorry, jump in. <laughs> What's that? I said agreed. Sorry, I had to jump in, but the last two seasons of South Park have been really, really good. Yeah, I, I, I was getting ready to give up. I'm not going to lie. You know, I, I, I love, I think Trey Parker is one of the great artists of our time for a number of reasons and everything he does. He, you know, look, I don't have to, I don't have to recount every single award he wins every time he does anything, whether it's video games or Broadway or whatever. I think that a hundred years from now, we're going to look back and see Trey Parker as one of the great visionaries of this era. Um, but, um, you know, South Park obviously is going to falter when its creator is making video games at an award-winning Broadway show and whatnot. You know, as a film professor, I had once said, you know, even Homer sleeps. Um, so, I, you know, South Park was starting to kind of flounder a little. Um, but these last two seasons really nailed it, really killed it. And though they might not necessarily be that related to old school Nickelodeon per se, Although my friend Jack Shee, who's an animation director on there, has actually talked with me about how he was inspired by Ren and Stimpy. And he told me a lot of the animators and stuff have like Stimpy dolls and such on their desks. So clearly there's some of that there. Um, regardless, I just think it shows that it's creator driven. Again, great music, uh, very risk taking, obviously, in every possible way from the way it's animated to the comments that they're making on society to its contrarian values. And I, again, I'm just happy to see that a show like South Park can continue and a show like uh, BoJack Horseman can survive and go on. And, you know, they get bought for fourth season, you know, before season three even airs. And um, so these are the, the shows, the last few seasons of South Park and um, BoJack Horseman, I think, that prove that there's still a lot going on um, and things that are happening that, you know, if not directly inspired by classic Nick, are inspired by the same spirit that created classic Nick and, and especially Nick tunes. Well said. All right. Well, I think we can conclude this podcast. So, um, Cassine, Matt, uh, why don't you talk about, uh, where people can find you at as well as your upcoming projects? Uh, Cassine, I just rambled on in coherently for about five minutes. Why don't you go first? <laughs> I think it was very coherent. Um, so yeah, I have, um, 
some new projects coming up. I have a um, a new uh, full length book project coming out, um, which I, I can't really discuss, unfortunately, yet. But um, but I, as soon as as soon as I can, um, I would I would love to come back on the podcast and talk about it. I think it's something that would be up uh, both of your alleys, um, but I, I can't go into it fully right now, but that's something that's slated for um, fall of 17, I believe. And um, besides that, doing some work with a V club, doing some work with decider and um, just keeping my, uh, my ear to the ground and, and uh, getting inspired by, by what's going on in terms of uh you know, nostalgia and writing about it for uh, for various outlets. But keep up with me, sorry, on social media. Um, CassineGaines.com, Facebook.com slash CassineGaines, C-A-S-E-E-N-G-A-I-N-E-S. And I'm on Instagram and Twitter at CassineGaines. And uh, I guess we've already talked about it a little bit. Uh, Cassine is actually going to appear in it. Um, and uh, Patricia, you, you were involved in some of our fun little social media postings that we're continuing to do. Uh, graciously, but uh, I am in the process of completing the Mark Summers documentary. Uh, it will be feature length. It's called On Your Mark, M-A-R-C, like Mark's name. Um, we've been working on it now for about a year, and um, it's going to focus a lot on Mark's one-man theater show, um, which I've seen and is absolutely fantastic. It's, again, funny, heartbreaking, uh, illuminative, um, it's, uh, it deals with his OCD. It deals with his, uh, battles with cancer over the last few years. It deals with the ups and downs of his career. Um, it was also co-written by Alex Brightman, a rising star in the Broadway world. He's the lead of school rock on Broadway right now. He just was nominated for Tony. He's in the documentary, of course. Um, we have some really great folks that we've interviewed for it. Uh, Guy Fietti from the Food Network, Seth Green, um, a couple other people that I don't think I'm going to mention yet just because uh, things are confirmed, but we haven't done it yet. So I don't want to say until it's in the bag, but definitely some really, really big name people that Mark's friends with and have worked with Mark and um, that, you know, I think are, are going to really help uh, give the, the project a lot of cachet. You can find out more information about this at www.marksummersmovie.com. Again, that's M-A-R-C, and it's got all the social media for all that stuff, Instagram and everything. We just did something Really fun um, with Nickelodeon as far as Mark being at Comic-Con, as a lot of people know. Um, and we were allowed permission to shoot a bunch of that. So you're going to see a lot of behind-the-scenes material that you didn't even see when they uh, aired some of it on Nickelodeon. So that's really cool. Um, and, yeah, it should be a lot of fun. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, you know, I'm still uh, writing some stuff here or there for various outlets. Um, I just started working for a publication called Baltimore Jewish Times. Um, you know, kind of need something a little more stable again, and uh, I'm excited to do that. I just moved to Baltimore for that, um, so and we're kind of rebranding and kind of changing around what the publication's going to be. I myself am not very religious, but I do uh, self-identify as Jewish and um, connect with that world uh, culturally, so I'm excited to kind of get a little bit more niche and community based on that and different kind of writing for me. Um, and, you know, a few other projects out there, I think, like Cassine, I can go on and on, but I'm not going to just because of time reasons. But always, always picking at stuff, always kind of having some fun with it. And, um, yeah, you can see stuff about Slime at slimethebook.com. It's got all of our social media for that. Um, and my own website is matthewclickstein.com, M-A-T-H-E-W-K-L-I-C-K-S-T-E-I-N.com. All right, and that is it for this podcast. Tune in next time as we're going to be concluding the three original Nicktoons month with a podcast discussing about how did the three original Nicktoons influence the animation industry? And I have two very special guests who currently work at the animation industry, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. So you'll have to tune in to find out who they are. So see you next time. Not just cartoons. We're Nicktoons. Not just cartoons. We're Nicktoons. Not just cartoons. We're Nicktoons. Not just cartoons. We're